This week on Mill Street, we're baking bread. We start with a trip to Austria to find a recipe for pumpkin seed bread. We then transform that into a light dinner roll. Then we go to Portugal to make broa. This is a classic European loaf married to an American cornbread. And finally, inspired by the cooking of Macau, we do a sweet potato cake with a sweet lime glaze. Stay tuned for Mill Street Does Bread right here on Mill Street Television. Funding for this series was provided by the following. Ferguson's proud to support Milk Street and culinary crusaders everywhere. For more information on our extensive collection of kitchen products, we're on the web at fergusonshowrooms.com. For 25 years, Consumer Cellular's goal has been to provide wireless service that helps people communicate and connect. We offer a variety of no-contract plans, and our U.S.-based customer service team can help find one that fits you. To learn more, visit ConsumerCellular.tv. Cooking happens in the kitchen, but life happens around the kitchen table. The 1919 Collection, celebrating yesterday, today, and tomorrow. Visit us at www.1919cookware.com. My mother-in-law is from Austria, actually from Salzburg, and so my wife and I go back hopefully every year to visit relatives there. And so we go to the farmer's market right in the center of town, and you can buy some sausage and cheese and Schwarzbrot, black bread, which is a specialty in Europe, especially mm -hmm. Austria. It's a very dense breads, and they have seeds in them, and they have mm -hmm. grains. So the pumpkin seed bread is one of those Schwarzbrots. So we thought that was a lovely idea, but we wanted to lighten it up and turn it into a roll. And so our resident baker, Erica has figured out how to do that. Yes, I have. And the first thing that we're going to do to really develop some great flavor in these rolls is we're going to make a sponge, which I know does sound intimidating to some people, but it's really not at all. We're going to mix a portion of our flour with some of the yeast, and we're going to let that sort of activate and develop some flavor. And for our sponge, we're actually going to use all rye flour. This is a half a cup of rye flour. It has a wonderful flavor, and it's also very traditional. Rye flour can um, absorb eight times up to its own weight in water. A friend of mine can absorb up to eight times its weight in beer. Really? So they have something <laughs> in common. Great skill. <laughs> but what this does is actually um, really traps a lot of moisture into these rolls and makes them really moist. So I'm gonna go ahead and mix that. And we're gonna do two teaspoons instant yeast. And we're gonna do a tablespoon of honey. And then I'm just gonna add a half a cup of water to this. And this is warm water, it's about 100 degrees. And this helps to get the yeast going and get it really active. I'm just gonna whisk this together. And then we're going to let this sit for about an hour. It's going to get about doubled in size. So before I do, I'm just going to cover it real quick with some plastic wrap. While we're waiting on that, we're going to move over here. We're going to uh, work on the other great flavor component of these rolls, and that is the seed mixture. We're going to be using pumpkin seeds, otherwise known as pepitas. And we did see a lot of recipes that called for all different ways of dealing with the seeds, oftentimes soaking them, but we didn't really feel that did anything to improve the flavor. So what we're going to do is sort of develop a seed butter. And so before we do that, we're going to toast the seeds because that really does improve their flavor and brings out, you know, a lot of their oils and aromas. So this is one cup of pepitas. And we're also going to add a half a cup of sesame seeds, which really added a nice nutty flavor. And we're just going to cook these on medium heat, five to eight minutes. And you're going to look for the sesame seeds to turn a nice golden brown color. Some of them may But pop. when sesame seeds start to color, they go fast. Right? They do, yeah. And you do. You don't want to walk away from this. You kind of want to keep an eye and keep stirring. Okay, so this is looking great. You can see the sesame seeds are nice light golden brown. I'm going to turn that off. Okay, and now before we make our seed butter, I'm going to measure out a half a cup of this mixture, and this is going to go on top of our rolls. It's a really nice garnish on top. Okay, the rest of this is going to go right into this food processor. And you really want to do this while the seeds are nice and hot. That helps release their oils. 
So you were saying earlier that in some of the older recipes, they soaked the pepitas, mm -hmm. whatever, because I assume uh, the pumpkin seeds were sort of gnarly bits in the Tough. bread. Exactly. Right. But we're going to take this another step further. We're going to make a total nut butter out of them because the oils actually stay fluid at room temperature. So I'm going to go ahead and puree these for one minute. All right, so you can see the seeds are now really finely ground. And to make our butter, we're going to add butter. That's brilliant. I, I know, it's <laughs> just riveting. This is four tablespoons of cold salted butter. And this is just going to take about another 20 seconds. OK, so this is all set. We're just going to let this hang out while we finish waiting on the sponge to finish fermenting. And that should take, again, about an hour. Okay, so it's been an hour and our sponge is ready and I want you to take a look at how much has been going on. I'm gonna take this off and you can see that it's risen and quite bubbly. So we're gonna go ahead and add the seed mixture and that's gonna add all that nice richness to this dough. And we're gonna add two and a half cups of bread flour. And then I'm gonna go ahead and put this on the mixer. I'm gonna put it on low speed. And I'm gonna add one cup, and we can use room temperature water for the dough. And I just like to add that slowly so that it doesn't all fly around. And we're gonna let this mix just until the dough comes together, about one minute. All right, this looks good. So what we wanna do is just get all of the bread flour in there hydrated. So we're gonna let this sit for about five minutes. The water activates the gluten, so that when it comes time to really mix the dough, it'll be extra stretchy and we'll get more out of it. We don't have to mix it as long. Okay, so it's been five minutes, and we're gonna go ahead and add two and a half teaspoons of kosher salt. And again, we're gonna mix it on low for about five minutes. Okay, so this looks great. This has been going for five minutes. And you, as you can see, the dough is starting to climb up the dough hook, but it's still sticking a little bit to the sides because this is actually fairly wet dough. So the, the takeaway here is that right. water and flour together can create gluten right. just the way actual physical kneading right. creates gluten. And if you want, you can touch the dough because I know it looks incredibly sticky and you're thinking to yourself right now, there's no way that we can actually shape this into rolls. Well, you think Maybe. I'm like negative about... No, but, but I want you to feel it because a okay. lot of what makes was making it moist uh. is all of the seeds, the butter and all of the oil. Yeah, it's um, not really sticky. Right, it's not sticky. Yeah. So we're just going to go ahead and cover this. And then this takes another hour to rise until it's tripled in volume. Okay. Okay, Chris, so it's been an hour, and as you can see, our dough has been very active, and it has risen yeah, three times. Yeah, it's amazing. Yeah. yeah. Okay, I'm going to dust the counter here, and then you want to be as gentle as possible, because we don't want to knock out this air, because we do want these rolls to be as fluffy as possible. Okay, I'm going to put a little flour on top. So what I'm going to do to make this easier to shape, I'm going to pat this gently out to a 10 by 6 rectangle. Jay? You are being very gentle. Yeah, well, we don't want dense little hockey puck rolls, right, no. for our holiday dinner. All right, so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to cut it into thirds lengthwise, and then I'm going to cut it into five strips going the other way to get 15. Now, and if they're not perfect, it's not the end of the world. I'll show you a little trick. So you're just going to take one of the squares of dough here, and you're going to sort of pull up the corners mm -hmm. like a little purse, mm -hmm. OK, and lightly pinch. And then you're going to put them on the sheet. We have a piece of parchment on our baking sheet here ready to go. And then you're just going to take your hands and you're gonna very gently pull the dough down under itself. So that's minimum handling. Yeah, exactly. Huh. And if you feel that like maybe this piece maybe isn't as big as the others, <laughs> it's not the end of the world. This one looks like it might have a little extra. I'm just gonna cut off a little corner there. You're going to tuck it in and hide it. Oh. oh, oh. So that we have a nice smooth top. So you wanna try one? I knew you were gonna say that. I don't know. Okay, you I'll, know, give, a have all I'll give a shot. I'll give a shot. Okay, so I'm gonna. Pull the edges up, corn. Yep. Like that. Like a, little together, like a little purse. Yeah, okay. And then you're gonna put it, the pinch seam side down onto mm -hmm. the baking sheet. Okay. And then you're gonna take your hands Fold it and like yeah. that. You're doing a good job. You're a good teacher. What can <laughs> I say? Now we're just gonna brush the tops of these with some egg wash. It's just one egg that I've beaten. And you wanna be real generous mm -hmm. because we want all our seeds to stick. The reason for the egg wash mm -hmm. is simply to get the nuts to stick to the top? Exactly, yeah. It acts like a glue. We tried water and that wasn't enough to get them and to stick. what about butter? Butter was worse. They just slid right off. Huh. Okay, and now here's our reserved seed mixture from mm -hmm. before. And we're going to very generously 
sprinkle these on. And sometimes you really need to kind of press to get it all to adhere. This adds a, a really nice crunch to these rolls. So you've got the nice soft tender inside and the crunchy nuts on top. And then one last thing we're gonna do is we felt that a big hit of salt really intensified the flavor of the seeds. This is Malden sea salt. Mm -hmm. it gives you a nice little crunch and hit. We're just gonna sprinkle those on top. Okay, and that's it. These are ready to rise one last time. I'm gonna cover them loosely with some plastic wrap, and let them rise for 30 to 35 minutes, and then I'm gonna bake them in that 450 degree oven for about 20 to 25 minutes. I'm gonna rotate it once halfway through, and we'll be ready to eat And we'll be eat ready them. to yes. eat them. Great. I gotta say, wow, because those look great. Well, you made half of them, so. So we have to eat take, half of you them. get the credit. So these have been cooling. These have been out of the oven uh, for 30 minutes. So we can eat them. So I don't know ready? if you really need a plate, but it, I'll give you, you a plate. I know. It's going to go right in your mouth. And these are great with some salted butter. I'll try it without butter first. You can see it has a nice, light, fluffy mm. interior. I'm going I'm to dip the butter. I'm a butter gal. Boy, that is good. So unlike Schwarzbro, black bread from Europe, which is very dense, which mm -hmm. is great, this is actually quite light. Yeah. yeah, it's light and fluffy. You got yeah. the crunch from the seeds on the outside, but it's not light in flavor. So our version of pumpkin seed bread, pumpkin seed rolls, based on Schwarzbro from Austria, a lighter version, uh, but has all the flavor, right. really great flavor. And they look great, too, with the topping, a little bit of extra mm -hmm. salt that really makes it. Yes. You know, I recently interviewed a guy called Abraham Conlon, who's co-author of a book called Fat Rice, based on the Chicago restaurant. This is Macanese cooking, the cooking of Macau. And it's interesting, it's Portuguese at first, and then Malaysia, North Africa, Philippines, it has lots of influences, but they bake, which is unusual for the Far East. And one of the things we really liked is a sweet potato cake flavored with coconut. And a lot of Macanese food, especially baked food, tends to be a little heavy. It's, it's sweet and heavy. So we like the combination, we like the idea, but we thought we'd you know, lighten it up, right? So you're here to lighten it up. I am, I'm here to lighten it up, Chris. This is one of my all-time favorite snack cakes. It's sweet, it's a little bit light, and just really kind of addictive. So to get started, we are gonna process our dry ingredients in a food processor. Very simple, I'm gonna add two thirds of a cup of coconut, and this is shredded unsweetened coconut. You don't wanna use the really sweet stuff you'd put on like a southern coconut cake. We have a cup and a half of all-purpose flour. I have two teaspoons of baking powder, two teaspoons of ground ginger, which is gonna make it a little spicy. I have half a teaspoon of baking soda and a teaspoon of kosher salt. Now we're gonna blend this all up and the goal is to really make a kind of coconut flour. So it's gonna take one to two minutes and it's just gonna get the flour and the coconut kind of the same consistency. And you can see all of that coconut really blended right into the flour. You wanna make sure you're using a food processor that has at least an 11 cup capacity, otherwise you're gonna overflow. So the next step is we're gonna blend a cup of dark brown sugar with a tablespoon of lime zest. And we do this in a lot of our recipes, blending the zest right in with the sugar. It helps release all those oils, and then you get that delicious lime flavor really evenly distributed. And this is just 30 seconds. And you can smell that, that lime zest. So now we're gonna add 12 ounces of sweet potato. And originally, the Macanese recipe called for a yellow sweet potato, which is a bit starchier and can actually be harder to find. But we found that the orange supermarket sweet potatoes produced a great flavor and they also give it a really beautiful color. We just microwaved them for about five minutes. You cover them and that way you don't have to introduce any extra water and dilute that sweet flavor at all. And I'm gonna process this just to mix them in. Okay, now that that is blended, I'm gonna add three eggs. We have three quarters of a cup of whole milk. The original recipe actually used coconut milk, but it made it very, very rich, and we wanted it just a little bit lighter, so it turns out whole milk is actually a bit less fatty. And a tablespoon of vanilla. And I'm just gonna blend this to combine. With the motor running, I'm gonna add a half a cup of coconut oil. We've warmed this a little bit just so that it blends in really nicely. 
And Chris, we used unrefined coconut here. You can really use either kind, but it really backs up that coconut flavor that we're bringing in with the dried coconut. If you so can. unrefined has more coconut it does. flavor, right? Exactly. Now, I'm just going to carefully pour this in and gently whisk it to combine. You don't want to overdo this, Chris, because of course we don't want to develop the gluten too much. And very often we do use a whisk instead of a spatula for gently folding in batter. That's right. Okay, and then we're going to put it in a 9 by 13 prepared pan. And all we've done is grease this with a little bit of that coconut oil. So we just spread this out, Chris, and then I'm going to pop it into a 350 degree oven for about 30 to 35 minutes until a toothpick inserted in the middle comes out clean. All right, and while that bakes, we can make the glaze. We have three quarters of a cup of powdered sugar, this could not be simpler, and two tablespoons of lime juice. So we already used the zest in the cake, and then we're just going to squeeze those limes to give us the liquid for our glaze. So when the cake comes out of the oven, we're going to let it cool for just 15 minutes, and then we'll brush this glaze on the still warm cake. But then we're going to wait a whole two hours before I let you have a piece. Of course. Okay, Chris, mm. you were very patient. You waited a full two hours to let it cool completely. You deserve a gold star, and now you get to have a piece of cake. Too bad you didn't make two, because I could have eaten the other one <laughs> while I was waiting. Cake. All right, I'm going to do big pieces. Do you like a corner piece? Are you a corner guy, or you want a middle piece? I will let you decide. All right. Yeah, corner's good. Corners are good. I like that little The only bit. reason I said that was the corner piece is slightly bigger, I think. So. And it's first, right? You don't even have to and wait for first. me. And it's first, yeah. So look at that. Nice color, little glaze on top. Oh, it's very light. Oh. I need a new adjective here. Wow? Is that, does that really do it? I mean, this is incredibly light, because I was thinking, well, you know, it has coconut oil, and it would be a little heavy. It's not heavy at all. It's incredibly light. Mm. It's like a tropical vacation with the coconut and the lime. Without the sunburn. Mm. Mm. Just one more bite. Mm. You know, one of the great traditions in America are snack cakes. This is the ultimate snack cake. I mean, it's light, it's delicious. It's a little bit unusual, too, but no nothing odd about it, nothing hard to find. So from Milk Street, it's a sweet potato cake with a lime glaze. I would make this every week for the rest of my life. <laughs> You know, if you spend more than a couple of days in Portugal, you're going to eat the best bread of your life. It's called broa. Now, when corn was originally brought into Europe, the Portuguese made corn flour, they combined it with rye flour to create a loaf that's a rustic European loaf. It's small, it's round, it's crackly and crispy on the outside. It's slightly yellow from the corn flour on the inside, has a whiff of molasses, it's really terrific. So, we went to get a cooking lesson, we went to a 100-year-old bakery. Its name is Padaria Amadina Inetu, and Manuel's the head baker there, and he showed us how they did it. He gets up at two in the morning, he starts a live wood fire in the granite and brick oven. When it gets really hot, about 600 degrees, he cleans out the oven, takes out the embers, and that's when they start putting the bread in the oven. Now, they have an unusual method. They use wooden bowls, and there are three bakers in a row, and they shape the dough using flour, and they toss it in the bowls. Finally, it goes onto a long paddle into the oven. So, let's make our version of Portuguese cornbread the Milk Street way. This is a cornbread. Portuguese cornbread, but it's not a cornbread. I mean, it's not the cornbread that I would think of, which is, you know, a batter and a skillet. This is a very different thing. This is a yeasted bread. It is. It's a fantastic, dense, really satisfying, chewy uh, loaf. It's made throughout Portugal in different styles. And this style that we're going to make today is based off of a cornmeal mush. Now, we're starting with corn flour, so which is a very finely ground cornmeal. You can use cornmeal, but it's going to be a slightly gritty, granular texture to the bread, so do look for corn flour. Okay. So we're starting with a cup and two-thirds. We're going to add it to our mixer, to which we're going to add two tablespoons honey for sweetness, and then we're going to add a cup of boiling water. We're going to mix it on low for about a minute. We just want to create sort of a thick mush. So that's looking good. So a, a lot of recipes, even for American stock cornbread or Southern stock cornbread, say hot water and cornmeal and make a mush out of it. Why do you do that? Well, you do it to hydrate the cornmeal. The cornmeal itself is, can be pretty hard. 
And by hydrating it, you're gonna soften it. You're also gonna ensure that the bread is very moist and tender. Okay. And now we're gonna wait about 30 minutes because we want it to be just warm to the touch. If we add the yeast now, it's gonna to be too hot for the yeast and could either kill the yeast or it's gonna to rise too quickly and you're gonna have an unstable crumb structure. Okay. So Chris, it's been about 30 minutes. The bowl has cooled off, it's just warm to the touch. So it's time to finish the bread. To this corn mush we've made, we're gonna add one cup of bread flour, a half cup of rye flour. Love the way it combines with the corn for this really rich flavor here. We're gonna add two teaspoons of yeast. Now this is instant yeast or rapid yes. rise? Yeah. Yep, two teaspoons of kosher salt and a quarter cup room temperature water. We switched to a dough hook from the paddle and now we're gonna knead it. It's gonna take a minute or two to come together and then wrap itself around the dough hook. The dough can look a little dry at first, but this isn't a dough where you wanna try and add more water. It just doesn't knead it with that cornmeal mush. So Chris, it's been about five minutes. The dough is gathered up into a bowl. It's really easily clearing the sides of the bowl. And we're gonna turn it off. And it's sticky, but it's not tacky. So I think we're great to go. You know, most dough recipes will have you just ferment the dough, proof the dough in the bowl, but we're gonna shape it and then proof it right on the, the baking sheet. So I'm gonna put it on the board and just give it a couple kneads with my hand. Make sure it's all blended well. And at this point, we wanna shape it into a five inch bowl. And it's interesting, it's not like a lot of really glutinous doughs where you can feel that tension build. And now I'm gonna dust the top with a little bit of bread flour and transfer it to the baking sheet, cover it, and we're gonna let it rise till it's about 50% bigger. Usually takes about an hour, hour and a half in a draft free spot. So Chris, let's give it a check. It's good. It's looking good. So it's grown by about 50% from its original size. You don't wanna let this go too far because the structure isn't great. It'll collapse if you let it grow much bigger than that. So, so most breads would be double in size, this is just 50%? Yes. Okay. At this point, we're gonna slide it in a 500 degree oven for 15 minutes. Then we're gonna reduce that temp down to 300 and finish baking it for another 30 to 35 minutes. Okay. So Chris, the bread's cooled about two hours on a wire rack and cool to the touch, so let's crack it open. Can I ask you a question? Have yeah. you ever actually waited two hours for a loaf of bread in the oven to cool before slicing into it? I never have. Really? Never happened. No. Really? Do you do that? Because the, the structure of the uh, bread Oh, here, here we go, here we go. I mean, it really but it's, it's warm. It, it's, it smells good. It's out of the oven. Uh, the butter melts on it. Patience is not your virtue, is no, it? No, it's not. Okay, let's give you a nice big slab there. By the way, I just want everyone to see what you consider a big slab. <laughs> jeez, jeez. Here's a big slab. Okay, there you go. It does, it does smell great, though. So, mm. I will say it's kind of a bread I like slicing on the thinner side. Helps appreciate the texture better. I'm just gonna put a little butter on mine, but here. Yeah? Go. Oh, thank Try you. That. Yeah. It has a fairly fine crumb, too. Huh? It does. Oh, boy, is that good. It's really good with butter. You know, the rye and the bread flour and the corn flour, it's just an interesting combination. It's got a, a ton of flavor. And you know what? It's really easy to make. That's not all the usual sort of scary stuff about baking bread at home. I have a question. So usually you proof the dough, you shape it, and then let it rise a second time. This is a one rise dough? One rise, that's it. Huh. That's all you need. It is sort of a dense, compact loaf. And you let it rise a second time, the structure's not there. You know, I've always said that American Southerners know more about cornbread than anybody in the world. They don't put their sugar in it, which is really important. But it turns out that Portugal also knows a lot. This is corn flour, rye, and, and bread flour. Very different than, of course, the American cornbread, but it's really, really a terrific loaf. It's sort of a, a mix between cornbread and a rustic European loaf. It's really great. So you can get this recipe, Portuguese cornbread, and all the recipes from this season of Milk Street at MilkStreetTV.com. Funding for this series was provided by the following. Ferguson's proud to support Milk Street and culinary crusaders everywhere. For more information on our extensive collection of kitchen products, we're on the web at fergusonshowrooms.com. For 25 years, Consumer Cellular has been offering no-contract wireless plans designed to help people do more of what they like. 
our U.S.-based customer service team can help find a plan that fits you. To learn more, visit ConsumerCellular.tv. Cooking happens in the kitchen, but life happens around the kitchen table. The 1919 Collection, celebrating yesterday, today, and tomorrow. Visit us at www.1919cookware.com. So here's the menu, churro first, and then squid sandwich. It's hot, it's crispy, it's delicious. Thank you. 